Yo, you there? Ooh, what's up, man? How's it going? Long time no speak, man. It hasn't been it's that been, long, has it? Nah, it's only been like what two weeks or something. I really haven't had that many questions, but okay. I, what's I came kind of I came kind of full of them today. So uh, this first one's kind of like a question, I guess, more Zach oriented because I got this from a video of his that he made about lists, and it okay. pertains to the bail bondsman list. I have no clue how this works and what to ask them because Illinois. Well, I, 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 I'm the guy. Who, I'm the guy who came. I'm never going to say I came up with it. I mean, guys, by the way, I hate when people say I came up with this special technique. No, you didn't, dude. By the way, wholesaling's been around a long time. It's just been a secret before like 2000. Okay, so anybody who tells you I came up with this method, it, it's like it's a cute like marketing gimmick, and maybe they put like a little extra spin on it, which that's fine. I, but I'm just telling you. Like cold calling, all this stuff. So, Bill Bondsman, what's your particular question on it? Um, honestly, I just don't know how it works and what to ask them. Because uh, do I find a list of like actual Bill Bondsman and ask them okay. if they have any property, or how do I go about that? So, here's the deal: like, so Bill Bondsmans are typically small business people, just like okay. you and me. And uh, most bail bondsmen are family-owned businesses, and they're usually handed down generation to generation, okay? So knowing that, you have to build some sort of rapport. It ain't like walking in and getting your code violation list or the eviction list. Unfortunately. Is you have to kind of connect with them. And it's just simply stopping by. Um, so hopefully you haven't had to use them personally. Um so you guys, so so you guys fully know a bail bondsman is like when when Johnny gets arrested, and he goes to jail. Depending on what state you are now, because some states you don't even have to post bail anymore. Um, typically, a bail um, for a very minor infraction, um, five hundred to a, a couple thousand dollars. Okay, so you have the option to either pay it in cash and you, you pay a bond, and then basically hold that in the court system to make sure you show up for your court date. If you don't. They take that money and then the popo go chase you down or uh, whoever, uh, Marshall, whoever chases you down. Now, when you commit a more major felony, um, say like battery multiple times, um, sometimes even big DUIs I've seen. But like if you commit something like really bad, you can have 10000 to a couple hundred thousand dollar bond. Okay. Most people can't afford that. Less than 1%. So what do you do? You, you sit in jail for the next six months to your court date. They give you an option to buy what they call a bail bond and then usually pay 10%. So if my bond set at $10,000, which is a common one, um, your mom can come down and pay the thousand dollars and get you out of jail. And then she has to sign it just like she does like a mortgage and a note. And sometimes they make them put up their house as collateral. Okay. Everybody get that. So if she's like, okay, I have to secure my house to do this. Some people have really large bails, like hundred thousand oh, dollars. So they got to put up a, a $10,000 and then she'll actually do payment plans. And then they'll put a lien in the first position on her house. And they're going to look at it. if the house has a bunch of mortgages on it, they won't do it. So what happens if little Johnny doesn't show up to his court date, mom's in trouble and she can lose the house quickly. Okay. So then if she doesn't show up, they call the bond due. If she hasn't paid in full, they immediately can start. There you go. Jason's got it right. Dog, the bounty hunter comes after him. Um, they can start a foreclosure process. Um, they can file to the courts and get a judgment against it and get the house foreclosed on. And I did, I do like dog, the bounty hunter though, but the whole story is sad about his wife, dude. I actually enjoyed her. So Anyways, I'm not going to go that. I get all weepy on it. Um, so now they have a problem because they're going to take the, like, they don't play. Okay. You either pay them or they're taking your home one way or the other. And this usually takes time anywhere from six to 12 months. So they have an inventory of it. Now, every now and then people will sign the house over to them, especially on like little houses. So if you're like Pennsylvania or Ohio and you got a $50,000 house and you had to put up like a ton of it. Then they're like, hey, listen, if you want, you can just sign the house over to us. It happens a lot more than you think. Man. So then they have an entire. So now, listen, they never have hundreds of houses, but a lot of times they have four or five. And sometimes they want them. Sometimes they don't. Here's the downside. They are brutally sharp people. They don't play around. 
Okay. And they're no strange, like they don't trust anyone. So it takes a while to develop a relationship with them. But every now and then I got mixed up in the most crazy, crazy deal ever with a bail bondsman. And I tried a few times. It took me about four or five months. And the guy kind of followed me. He goes, listen, um, we have a house. His mom's signing it over to us. He was like a pedophile or something like that. And uh, they're like, we, we kind of want nothing to do with it. But, you know, here's our fee. And they made it tight. We had to negotiate it forever. And we wound up, I wound up wholesaling it and it worked. These aren't the easiest deals in the world, but as the market shifts and you're in the lower, and they usually focus on the lower range price houses. Listen, if someone's got a $500,000 house, it's not going to the bail bondsman. They'll, they'll cash it out one way or the other. So that being said, you guys need to open your door up with these bail bondsmen because you'd be surprised how many times they do it. Also, bail bondsmen, they put a lien on the house. That's an indication there could be something majorly wrong. And remember, you don't always have to approach it from the bail bondsman. You could get the lead from the bail bondsman and then go deal with the mother to fix the house issue. Go, listen, not because in the end of the day, you know what the bail bondsman wants, right? Uh, uh, it's money. They just want to get paid. They don't want the real estate. And that's why I'm telling you guys that you can have massive amount of motivation there. Some of them are a little bit sharper. And by the way, they always keep the properties they want and they're usually full. Remember, these are family owned businesses, usually 50 plus years. Nobody just goes open a bail bondsman and shows up in a city. You have to have deep connections. How do you market for bail bondsmen? I know you guys see the billboards, but for the most part, the reality is they have a lot of repeat clients and that's how they oh, do man. it. Like the family, I'll call, call John. Everybody knows like the uh, local bail bondsmen. And by the way, here's another way to find your bail bondsman. They're usually painted pink or yellow or like highlight green because they want people to be able to find it real fast. Okay. So, um, Iron has got it. He's right. They are not realtors. They don't want to actually, they want to get their bonds paid. Okay. And they have interest accruing every day at the highest possible rate of law. It's usually probably around 18%. <coughs> so it is massive incentive for if mom put up bail for a son, she's got to rectify the problem. And unfortunately, a lot of people have to sell their houses to fix this issue. And, um, families help out families. I get it, but um, I'm not here to judge what they got it for, but ju listen, just, if you just got a lead from a bail bondsman when like he took it, like he goes, I secured it with this house and I'll tell him straight up, I go, you know, you don't really need your permission to contact the owner, but it'd be nice if yeah. you could work with the bail bondsman, do it. Be very careful. These people are locked and loaded and ready to go. Like there's bars on the window. They assume everyone's out to hurt them. So just be very careful when you approach a bail. Make sure you do it at like high noon. Do not go in there on like a Saturday night. So bail bondsmen's work. I'm telling you, there's a lot of them. We got like five or six in our town. I know three of them very well. And uh, it's just, it's interesting. I, at the worst case scenario, you're going to get some really good stories out of it. But the idea is start that relationship. If you want to stay in wholesaling, it is another lead source. No other wholesaler ever talks about it. It's not the easiest one, but I gotten good deals out of it. I don't get a lot, but when I get them, they are highly, highly motivated. Probably the most motivated sellers you'll ever meet, um, probably above probate. But the problem is they don't have 50 properties. And so if you go in with that attitude, you're, you're going to get, and you do not want to run these people over. Oh yeah. I see why. You see why? So you just go in and have an exploratory conversation. And the minute they go, well, you don't need a bells bonds. And they go, listen, no, they go, listen, but you know, if you ever have a property that you're having a problem, like you have a lien on, I, yeah, because they call the homeowner like, Hey, listen, uh, uh, you know, either sign the property over to me or I'm going to file a, uh, I'm going to get a lawyer to file all the actions. And I'm just going to take it from you. Well, once they're going to take it from you, might as well find some, some way to help the homeowner out. So sometimes bell bins, they, they help. Now, I've also been on the other side where there's a lien on the house from a bail bondsman. So some of the smaller liens, like 10000 or less, they let them ride. Why do, they, why do you think they let them ride on the house? Um, I'm stumped. That 10000 turns to thirty, turns to 50000 Like 18% okay. recurring yeah. daily interest is um, they can triple them in like just a few years. Okay. So, but when it's like 100000 they have to get paid because they... they it's you know, just too much. It's too much. But the little ones, they sit there. It doesn't get away. So 
Um, now, I haven't found a correct way to search just for bail bonds lien. So if maybe somebody on the feed wants to do a research project on how to narrow down bail bonds leads, it would be an interesting uh, search. Because those, I'm telling you, those are the most deadly liens you can put on a property because they have every, um, they have more rights because it was a bond. So they can accelerate it a little bit faster. But I, I'm not a lawyer. I don't get into that stuff. I'm just telling you guys, I struck up a conversation and I got a property. It took about four to five months. And then what I did is I had one of the bail bondsmen, they would give me leads of houses they put a lien on the property before they actually went public. And I had a leg up to just go talk to people. And usually you're helping out because usually it's like a mom or a grandma and they're just trying to help out a, a, a troubled youth or something like that. Sometimes they're not youth. Sometimes they're like my age or older and it happens. Guys, I've had people with like multiple DUIs on this. Like that's probably one of the biggest ones you'll see on them. Keep in mind, like some people don't have gas to put in their car. So if they even have to pay a thousand dollar bond, it's hard for them to do. So that's why bail bonds and bail bonds know they will go to real estate before they go to a car, a boat, an RV or anything else. Okay. Because it guarantees them payment. Yeah, I, I used to have a because uh, uh, Illinois doesn't have bail bondsmen. Bail bondsmen, so my my understanding is like super limited. I used to think that uh, they were the people who put up the bond, like cash for them, and if they skip town or something, then they would get to foreclose on the house or something. But now I kind of get a better understanding. It's um, they're the ones who go after uh, the person who put up the bond, the collateral, if they do skip town and don't go to court. Well, see, so I'm not I'm not here to get into like how bail like. I'm not like a bail bondsman. Unfortunately, my, my history is watching Dog the Bounty Hunter. But <laughs> most bail bondsmen is um, if you skip bond, they can put out like a, what do they call it? A APB for your arrest. And then like there's, uh, so if some, so here's how I understand it. And guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but like to me, this is kind of cool. Like if you think about it, because who knew wholesaling would lead to like this is if there's a hundred thousand dollar bond and somebody puts up 10 grand, if that if they don't show up, the court goes, we want our hundred thousand dollars now. The ninety thousand dollar difference is covered with an insurance policy. Okay? So it's like title insurance. Either you rectify this in the next like sometimes it's 30 days, or like we're we're going to up your premiums and you're gonna be responsible for the difference. So they put a bounty on them and then they'll pay someone like um a third of the bond to go out there and bring them in because it's cheaper to pay than that than to pay the entire amount. So the idea is back, you know, so back in the old days when they used in the wild west, they put out a bounty for someone that skipped town. And that's how this whole, I guess, I don't know. I'm not, okay. somebody in law enforcement can kind of tell me, but I, I find it like really fascinating, but I will tell you anything on TV. It's hard to believe because the whole dog bounty hunter, there's no money in chasing criminals down like they do with that, with like mace guns and stuff like that. The money is in, basically they're selling you an insurance policy and they're underwriting it. And they only want to give it to people that they know they're going to show up to court or they can secure, securitize it with some sort of asset. Unfortunately, most people that commit crimes don't have assets, so they have to go down the family chain to find people. Um, and that's how it works. So unfortunately, like the the responsible person, the family winds up being the victim in this whole thing because they do this over and over again when they get out behind bars. So I don't know how it's working in these states where they like, you don't even have to put up bond anymore unless it's like a very serious crime. But um, guys, reach out to your bail bondsman. Nothing bad's going to happen. Don't go at night. Don't go on weekends. Go nine to five and just talk to them. And the best person to talk to is going to be the, the girl behind the counter. You don't want to talk to like the salty old man. He doesn't want to hear from you. He's been in the business 40, 50 years. He don't care. And usually it's like the wife or someone like that there. And uh, it's, it's uh, I think it's like fascinating and interesting, but that, you know, that's why I love it. Real estate always has to tie to something because, because real estate is the most secure thing you can, uh, you can do other than like a bank account, but a bank account you can pull out anytime. So go connect with your bail bondsman. I'm telling you, um, it, it might have a deal on it. If anything, it's going to open up doors. So when it does come time, you can talk to them. Because the problem is you have to have three or four conversations before you're even going to get access to that list. If you think you're going to walk in there and give me a list, yeah, you could be chased out of there quickly. So, 
I got okay. you. Okay. Uh, I got some more questions. Forgive me. I'm going to be all over the place, like from topic to topic. With well, the I'm going to I'm going to give you two more questions because I, okay. I want to help out as many people as I can. So, guys, by the way, I love it. my favorite thing. I'm going to get a T-shirt that says, "I got a quick question." <laughs> I got a quick question. And I'm going to sell it for charity because, and, and I get it, but like that's everyone's go-to line. So, just be organized with your question. I want to help out, but remember, I'm I'm trying to help out as many as I can. So, the idea is I try not to answer the same question too many times at, in the same life, but go ahead. What, what you got? Prioritize got them. Okay. Um, I'm gonna try to figure this out. Okay. So first, um, when signing contract with an LLC, do you need to have like a representative name? So if I were to give an example, like let's say you were trying to sign a contract on behalf of uh, flip with Rick LLC, would you put, uh, Rick Ginn representing, uh, flip with Rick LLC, or could you just put, um, as long as you have signing authority, flip with Rick LLC. So, uh, so if I'm president of the LLC, um, signing on, uh, what is it? And by the way, this is important guys. Um, um, uh, you can put on there, um, uh, president of flip with Rick. Um, what, what is it? I put on that actually, unfortunately I have people who prepare this for me, so I just sign it. So I haven't looked at it in a while, <laughs> okay. but you, you have to distinguish your signature. Otherwise you're signing it for it personally. So you, you put in your, you know, your John Hancock in there and under there, just put president of, of flip with Rick, uh, or on behalf of flip with Rick as president, you have to distinguish. I got caught once I did that and they, we had a contract go sideways and I had a lawyer to like try to attack me on it. I actually had to settle. It cost me some money. So actually he's making a good point. I'm not a lawyer. I don't want to give you like legal advice, but if you're going to sign your personal name, and you're like the president or whatever, a managing member, you have to designate the title in print below it. And if they can't read it, they won't recognize it. So on our contracts, when we do it, a lot of them we do typed, they put it under there and nobody can ever misinterpret it. The person that attacks that are the lawyers. So number one, don't piss anyone off. Number two, do what you sign you're gonna do. And number three, when you sign your name, if you're not signing it for it personally, be very clear and distinguish your title below it because then the lawyer is going to go, okay, I want to find out if he's president of flip with Rick. And if he's not, I'm going to nail his butt. And then that's what they do. So a lot of you guys just sign haphazardly and you're depending on a title company or someone else to put it, make sure, especially if you have an LLC or a corporation, when I sign my name, I don't want to be personally responsible for it because you want to shield at least go through it. And it's really, really important. So that's a good point. It makes sense. Okay, I got you. So no matter what, you want to have somebody's name on there to represent. Yeah, you. and just make sure because I mean, some of you guys are presidents, so you call you so you call yourself a president, uh, a secretary. What's the other one? Uh, Founder, vice president. Whatever. You can call yourself a managing member. Get your title right because titles do count in this business when they do it. So, um, what else you got? Okay. And so I spoke to, cause I, I've been calling out probates lately. So I spoke to a title company attorney yesterday and they told me that in order to close on the property mid probate while it's still open, it depends on whether it's summary or formal administration. What, uh, what state you're talking about? Florida. So you should, you should know about that pretty well. Yeah. He's, he's lying to you. I'm just going to tell you up front. Okay. So whether I've done hundreds of them, whether it's so summary by the way, uh, a summary is a piece of cake, piece of cake. Do you understand what a, uh, a summary administration is? I read up a tiny bit on it. All I know okay. is that it's, let me just do it. A summary administration is saying we, we had to announce the world probate because, uh, the person, um, died. And then this is usually like husband, wife. And what the lawyer is doing is, okay, the property was homesteaded. As long as it qualifies, they resided full time in the property. He's filing a motion to take that property out of probate. Once they file that motion, it's 30 to 45 days. Basically, if it was John and Sally Smith and Sally passed away, that motion takes Sally off the deed and now makes John the sole owner of it. If you can beat that to the punch, you will get an awesome wholesale deal. If you wait till probate's over, you're going to have to bid like everybody else. And that's the problem. Now, simply, all you guys have to do, and remember, this varies state to state. So I'm not going to go into specifics. I'm not a lawyer. I don't claim to be a lawyer. I'm very, I, I battle lawyers all the time in, in the Southeast, particularly in Florida. 
you educate the homeowner, 99% of lawyers will say this. You have to wait till the probate's over. Always. I was, always. listen, I'm probably not the only guy this, but everybody else kept it a secret. I said, why do we have to wait? And I went and saw every lawyer in town. I even met with a judge. And you know what the judge told me? He goes, you don't have to wait. He goes, you can just file this motion and you can take it out. You can get it sold, the asset sold. The proceeds still have to go to the probate. The probate still takes time to get done, but you can get rid of it. And actually, we encourage people to do it at real estate because most people don't want to pay the mortgages. They don't want to deal with hurricane season. They don't want to deal with mowing the lawn. They don't want to deal with the utilities. And for that reason, lawyers don't tell you. Why do lawyers not tell you? What do you think? Why? Oh, they want to make more money. There you go, guys. I'm just sorry that like they're, they're in control. So the best way to beat this, you could do it in a formal too. There's, there's no, no difference. Formals just take longer for the probate to close. So a probate is a vehicle to wrap up all the assets that the deceased person passed away. Okay. Remember a dead person cannot sign a deed or a title for obvious reasons, right? So the only way you can do is enter into a court order. And that's how the probate comes. A summary administration is just the, uh, I'm just going to pull it out of probate because this house qualifies for X amount of exemption. Guys, you can check in your local states where I'm not a lawyer. I don't want to get into like teaching the legal of this. Yeah. And those deals usually go down in less than 90 days. They are my absolute favorite. Once you get it under contract and someone's designated as the personal representative, they have the legal authority to do whatever they, they can enter into an agreement. It doesn't mean they can sell it and liquidate. They can enter an agreement. So when they enter an agreement with you, now you have leverage in the, con in the uh, deal. And once you have leverage, a lawyer can't push you out of the way. Okay? So a lawyer wants to surround a probate and go, everybody has to go through me. Why? Because that's the money ticket. More fees. I can tell them they need appraisals. That goes half of it in my pocket. Oh, we do a BPO, and then I can file more and more paperwork. I've seen probates as cheap as, so in the state of Florida, on average, it costs about $863 to file a probate. I don't know if I'm up to date on that, but okay. And then you have to pay the attorney their time. So an express probate, honestly, should take, it used to be $1,500, I'd say $2,000. Dude, they file like one or two pieces of paperwork, and that's it. They don't go to court. And okay. then they're going to charge, you know, two or three hours of legal fees plus court fees. That's the true cost of it. Why do I see people with twelve and fourteen thousand dollars for a summary, uh, a, a summary uh, probate? Why? Because that's the, the lawyer can get away with it because we don't yeah. understand it. So I know a sensible. Listen, if you pay more than five grand for like a really easy probate, you're getting jacked. It's just. But like, it's very confusing. Like I, I remember when I went through probate with like my family, like I didn't know. I'm like, is that the normal price? I have no idea. And so you can't run the attorney under the bus. So if you can enter an agreement with that homeowner and now you've got leverage, okay? Once you have leverage, you go to the homeowner and go, listen, and then you get this information from your title company. Go, how can this personal representative get this property sold? He goes, oh, they just need to file this motion with the judge to liquidate the asset. Once they file the motion within 30 or 45 days, it should be approved unless the judge has a question. Okay. I've only been questioned one time in nine years on probates. Okay. He says, why are you buying it so cheap? It was a complete <laughs> gut job. And he's like, okay, that makes sense. The court's job is not to substantiate if you got a fair price. They just want to make sure everything's legal. The will is followed and all the correct parties are in consent. Okay. That's it. And attorney's like, they, they make it like it's like this magic. Like, there are some complicated probates, but I had a probate that took um, four years. We sold the house in six months. It took her four years to get that final proceeds. But she was like very thankful. She goes, Rick, that would have cost me another $100,000 to keep that high end house. Yeah, that's insane. And so like everybody hides behind these lawyers. I'm like, I'm just telling you, they're all in, like, there are some good lawyers out there. Just like there's, there's, good, there's good teachers out there. there there's, there's good mentors. But like for the most part, Wholesalers are so busy going so fast. Sometimes you slow down and you learn this. Full disclosure, I didn't learn this till almost like nine years, 10 years into being a wholesaler. You know how many I got stepped on and walked over? I just got sick of it one day. So what else you got? I want to help some other people out here. All right. I, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then just so on that last part about the, uh, the filing the motion, is that the only thing that we have to do differently uh, when dealing with probates? And can they still sign the purchase and sale agreement 
before as long as they're they're the designated personal representative aka the executor that court gives them the legal authority to act on basically the deceased person's behalf they have the right to enter into it okay so i would get them to agree to the contract and then you get the contract them. you have leverage okay? okay perfect let it sign let the ink dry run some title with the title company and go to your title company go listen i have this agreement they're the pr they want to do the summary uh you know uh the the uh, summary administration is what it's called and what do i got to do to get this property sold he was like you'll need a mo i need a motion from the judge they'll need it for title and go can you tell me what that motion is and then here's the hard part you got to go back to the owner now and go listen you need to tell your lawyers to file this motion Okay. And every lawyer gets pissed when they hear it. They they really throw a temper tantrum. Uh, I don't want to do that. They don't want to do it because it's an extra piece of paperwork and they feel like they don't have as much control on it. So you have to go through the homeowner because they, the, they're being re represented by their lawyer. You don't really have any say in it. The secret here, guys, the secret to making probates work is entering that contract before you got to go through the lawyer like uh, gatekeeper because they're difficult. They want to review every contract. So if you get it signed before, you don't have to review the contract. You don't have to negotiate the price. You just have to get through it. I've had lawyers drag me on six months to a year. Sooner or later, I'm getting it. I got one going on two and a half years now. Oh my God. But check this out. The price from two and a half years ago is ungodly. And the, uh, the PR goes, listen, can you pay me a little bit more? I go, if you get it done, I'll give you 10 grand more. The thing's worth like 90 grand more. Like I, you oh, got to be reasonable, yeah. like when it goes up like that. But when it goes down, I do the same exact thing. I'm like, okay, we got to go down. I've had to go both ways. So here's a little secret too, guys. Sometimes the, so a petitioner is the person that files like the probate with the attorney. Okay. You never want to contact the attorney. You're, you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the, the person waiting to be designated as the executor is like, well, I don't have the legal authority yet. And sometimes lawyers like just drag their feet. I go, I tell you what, here's what I'll do. If you're okay with the price and the terms we spelled out, I know I have to be patient. If you want to sign the agreement, at least I'll go ahead and set the money aside. I'll take a look at the house and everything. And then if there's any problems, I'll back out of the contract for you. Sometimes I do it to protect other wholesalers or realtors from trying to list the property or buy the property. I will tell you, lawyers hate that. And that, um, I got kicked, I've gotten kicked out multiple times and she didn't have the legal authority to enter in that contract. Yeah, but she wants to sell it. Wake up. Like I want to help people out. You want to walk through like legal terminology. So we're always trying to, I always go to the seller. What do you need? She says, Rick, I really want to get rid of this property. And then they'll go like this, but my attorney told me. And I'll go, Always. Martha, what do you what do you want to do? Like in the perfect scenario, what what would make this like what would set your mind at ease? And she's like, I, honestly, I just like to agree and like I want it done. I like I want to know it's locked in. I want to know you're not going anywhere. Okay. I'll tell you what, enter in the agreement, and then we'll just kind of keep it between us. And then let me know when you have the legal authority, and then we'll hand it to um, the lawyer. And then worst case scenario, you have them go back and re-sign the last page of the contract. It's legal, but what that does is it prevents other wholesalers or realtors from coming in and snatching your deal on timing, which happened all the time to me. You're better off having an unauthorized signature than no signature, in my opinion. Because part of this is mental acceptance, right? And the other part's legal. And we're always dealing with the mental acceptance the hardest as wholesalers. The legal, like, eh. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I recently had a, uh, a lawsuit like based on this and they go, well, she didn't have the legal authority because the heirs didn't know about it. I go, is she part of the heirs? Yeah. Not my pro Like, what do you want me to do? So they go, listen, and you can buy one tenth of the property. I go, okay, I'll take one tenth of it. They're like, well, wait a minute. That screws it up for everybody else. I go, exactly. I go, listen, someone has to be like, she wants to sell it. The fact that all these errors came out of the woodwork's not my problem. And I go, we'll work with the, I, I go, I'm not spending money on an attorney. Like I'm enforcing my contract. So they have to go to court to nullify my contract and it costs money, but I have to go and testify. I don't have to testify. My employee has to testify and it, it's, it screws up the title real bad. And okay. so I go, listen, why don't you tell the others we want to buy it? 
and then find out what the number is. And they come back like a million dollars. It's crazy. So get it signed and try that little trick. Worst comes to shove on it. But always, if they want to sell it and put it to bed, help them out, even if they don't have the legal authority to protect your deal and, and say, listen, when it's official, let me know. I'll come up with we'll meet you. We'll look at it again. We'll have a cup of coffee and we'll, we'll seal everything up. Works all, all right. the time for me, man. That's okay, how so I you, teach, teach my acquisition people to do it. Okay, yeah. So even if they don't have that uh, legal authority, you can still get the uh, contract signed and then revisit it once. Yeah, they... but I understand you're getting a mental signature. So okay, have you ever signed something but like you didn't have the legal? The people do it all the time. You're not buying that house like you know you can't close until you get the legal authority. Yeah. But in the last four years, you almost had to do that because I had so many people like approaching her. And like, I would get it under like, uh, you know, we'd offer 210,000 and then the guy goes, I'll give you 250, I'll give you 260. And then they start going, well, crap, you know, well, he's going to give me more, Rick. Can you do more? And it's like, because I didn't get that signature, it cost me 40 grand. But if they sign it, they go, I already made a commitment to the house. And most wholesalers don't understand the difference between a, a, a legal commitment and a mental commitment as wholesalers, yep. everybody understand what's live. We fight for the mental part. I can't control the legal. I leave that up to a legal team and title companies. Okay. So if you can get people to mental every now and then you will lose some of them, but give me, if you give me 10 contracts and I had to get them to sign eight of them mentally, eight out of 10 will stick because most people want to stick to their word. Okay. Verbal different story. 50, 50 at best. So if yeah. you had a verbal agreement, would you be more comfortable with a verbal agreement? or an unauthorized signed agreement. Definitely the signature because that, that's still, you put it on paper. So, so it's the in same your mentality I teach you when we have the uh, upfront agreement with customers. Okay. Wait a minute, Johnny. You told me you'd make a decision. Yes or no. At the end of verse, then we agree on that. And they're like, yeah, you're right. People don't want to be called liars. So especially if you put it in writing, they definitely eight out of 10 people want to live up to their word. I know that's crazy in the United States these days, yeah. but it's true. Okay. So understand that. So, okay, but I got to let you go. I got to help some other people out here, I man. Okay? It, man. You have a good night. Okay. See ya.